Hi, and welcome to this episode of the Data Revolution podcast. I'm Kate Carruthers, and my guest today is Steve Wilson. Good day, Kate. Steve... Oh, hello. I'm going to introduce you, Steve. Steve is an original thinker whose research achievements include six US patents, three in public key security, and three in biomedical technology. He's a researcher, an innovator, and an analyst in data protection, and he's been a lead digital identity advisor to governments around the world, and he has been awarded 10 patents. There were six before, now there's 10. Anyway, he is um, somebody who is one of my go-to people for things around data protection and security. Welcome to the show, Steve. Well, again, good day, Kate. Good to, good to see you. Thanks for having me. I was just pondering how we met, and I actually think my very dear friend Still Garion introduced us probably a long time ago. Could be, <clears throat> could be. I floated around UNSW for a long time. I I um, started a a post um, grad course there some time ago, and uh, l- love UNSW, love love people like you. Um, so yeah, there would have been lots of intersections, I'm sure. Mm, mm. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, you know, I love this um, um, all power to data theme of yours and, and the way that you are, are, um, are uh, digging up so many important lessons in your professional background in data and, and it's all being reinvented. So there's many ways in. Um, I like to unpack how important data is in the economy. I nearly said digital economy, but but, you know, we're, we're dropping the digital now, aren't we? The digital economy and the economy are the same thing now. So, look, there's a number of ways into the topic, but I, um, I'm i working a lot at the moment on and thinking a lot about how do we protect data at, at a level that um, is commensurate with its value. So whether you think that data is like the new crude oil or not, like every metaphor that one's a bit radioactive it's it's got strengths and weaknesses but look that is important and we don't protect it and i think that we should and that is a really good point because you know if you think about data as an asset you've also got to think about it as a liability and it's the two sides of the one coin now because yeah. you know if you keep too much data and you don't protect it adequately you can have a data breach which i've been in every major data breach in australia in the last 12 months and it's not theoretical. These um, data breaches are not fantasy. They're, um, in fact, they've become, in a, in a way, they've become a little bit mundane, and that's so dangerous. Security geeks like to say data breaches are inevitable. And I tell you what, my head explodes. I don't know why we think that it's cool to just accept that sort of thing. It's it's horrible um, to, to accept any level of data breaches, let alone to say we're all going to be breached, get over it. Well, I can, I can, I always feel a sort of a strange sort of kinship with the people who've been breached because a lot of the time, you know, I've been in IT and I've been one of the people saying we need to invest and been told no. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that most of those organizations had people who wanted to invest in protecting the data and were told no. So I do have some sympathy for some of the people in those organizations, but. Yeah. Hundred percent. It, it's a it's a wicked job. Um, IT security and cyber security in general. But you know what is it that makes data valuable? I, I think that that's really important. Um, we've we've got this vague idea of data protection, which in the rest of the world is synonymous with data privacy. You know the GDPR has data protection in its in its name, and while in Australia we do privacy impact assessments. In Europe, they do data protection impact assessments. So, you know, privacy and data protection are really literally synonymous in a lot of the literature. But I think that what we do in data protection, I mean, I I love it. I'm actually one of the rare technologists who advocates for data privacy principles and data privacy law. But I think it's only a model, like it's only a start. We... um, Data privacy boils down to a set of principles that are about limiting the collection of personal information, um, limiting the use of personal information, limiting the disclosure, not banning collection, use and disclosure, but limiting it. 
and being transparent and getting rid of data when you finish with it. And all of this stuff actually turns out to be a pretty bloody good idea for in the light of data breaches. But I think that it's just a start. Um, there's a default assumption that data is valuable and you should keep it close. But it's not a very artful way of looking at the value of data. Um, we actually want to share data, um, not only as businesses and governments and researchers, but, I mean, think about it, individuals absolutely need to share data, <clears throat> partly because social media uh, and just being social requires you to talk about yourself. But well, also because, to get you know, digital you services, see, you need to you need to tell people stuff. You need to share your shopping that's history. That's what I was about to service. mention. You know, is yeah. is we want to take friction out of our processes, and the way we can take friction out of our processes is data and automation. So we need to share our data to make that happen. And you know, who wants to go back to the bad old days? I can remember going to the Department of Motor Transport back in the day and being in the queue and with pieces of paper and stuff. And now it's miraculous with Service New South Wales. You can do it all on your on your phone. You don't have to talk to anybody, and that's powered by data. Yep, yep. It's um, it's a modern miracle. Some of that stuff, and and data sharing and you know data disclosures got a bad rap, and you know the, some of the data brokers have really poisoned the well, haven't they? They've um, they've made data sharing synonymous with data surveillance and surveillance capitalism and that's that's kind of sad because you, you can't live under a rock i mean civilized people want i mean to be really blunt i want my doctor to know stuff about me and if the doctor thinks it's in my interest for the nurse to know the same things about me then i need to trust the doctor to be sharing data behind my back um COVID helped me get over my aversion to <laughs> electronic health record because, you know, you were going to doctors and I was just like, they need to know. I, I need to just let them have it. Right. And But you must have in the back of your mind some comfort that there's professional standards for, for medical providers, don't you? Like it's different. Telling your doctor your history. Oh, no, one of my on mates does, does tech support for my local GPs. It's terrifying. <laughs> Uh-oh, yep. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of sausage making going on in general practice software, that's for sure. Well, you know, they're, they're essentially small businesses and small businesses really have no idea about data protection and data security. So, you know, there's large swathes of the Australian economy that are unprotected. And, you know, mm. working as I do in a big organisation that's, you know, working on things like the security of critical infrastructure and privacy legislation and stuff, you know, we, we can forget that there are organisations that don't even know that these things exist or know how to even approach data security. Yeah. Yeah. We set people up to fail, especially in small business and in general practice. Um, but, you know, the another thing to talk about is the mental models that people have for, for data and how it works and what does it mean to control data? Um, <clears throat> can we have a reasonable expectation that people can control data for themselves? So I've been in, can I talk about identity? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a big part. I think it's an, an important part of the fabric of the data worldview. You know, the bits that I think are important, there's the data, the storage, there's there's the integration of data sources, there's the identity and access management, there's um, knowing who the individual is, so master data management, so that you get a, a golden record so you know who you're talking to. So I see all of that as, as a big part of the data landscape that we need to master. Yeah, yeah. And, and it boils down to context, isn't it? Like, what do you need to know about people in different contexts? You talk about a master record or a, or a golden record, but that's going to be a different record from context to context, isn't it? Mm. And and so that's one of the things we're talking about at work is, is you know, how, how, do, how can we make contextually relevant information about individuals available in a context and do it safely and securely? Yeah, now, that's one of the cool things about some of the tech that's emerging, like the verifiable credentials technology is wonderful. Explain what that means, because not everybody will know what that means, and I'm really interested mm. to talk about this. Okay. So um, we all know what credentials are in real life, I think, like um, 
<clears throat> a university credential or a credential a passport to That's drive a car or, or a passport is like a credential to cross borders um and the verifiable credentials movement is partly about digitizing those things in a reliable high quality way so um not just taking photocopies or <clears throat> scans or copying down numbers but actually capturing the metadata about who issued a credential when was it issued what are the rules and terms and conditions for a credential you know if you if you're claiming to be an accountant that's sort of interesting but you know what's the metadata what's your scope of practice where were you qualified um where are you licensed to work so you can wrap all of that stuff into a digital document and you can try and format it to be machine readable that's kind of straightforward and you can digitally sign it by the issuer so it's tamper resistant and it's got provenance you know exactly that it's come from the Australian chartered accountants people rather than the American for example so I'm building up this picture that the verifiable credential is you know partly a digitization partly a signature of the issuer so you know where it's come from the final twist in this is that if you issue a credential to the right sort of end user wallet then when it's in the right hands you can prove that it's in the right hands you can prove that when somebody rocks up to a website and says hey I'm an accountant from Australia you can actually also prove that it, the right person was in charge of the presentation so look accountants that's a bit sort of airy fairy but what about proof of age this is really important in Australia we've got a whole lot of um, state and federal initiatives to require proof of age for when you're buying liquor online for example these are rules that are going to be legislated as we you know in the next few months so it's a wicked problem how do I prove that I'm over 18 without proving everything else about myself you know I don't want to necessarily talk about how old I am or where I live or whatever I just want to prove one fact about myself which is that I'm legitimate to buy grog um that's a really important use case but it is in Australia <laughs> yeah now um is it the grog or the law that you're talking about I think I think the the purchasing of booze in Australia is an important <laughs> cultural thing it's critical infrastructure um the, the final part of this verifiable credential story is really important. The, the liquor store wants to know, as well as it can, that if somebody's claiming to be over 18, it's really, you know, that credential's in the right hand. So that's called proof of presentation or proof of ownership. And that's now it all boils down to cryptography. So the credential is digitally signed by the issuer, you know, government or um, New South Wales Driver Licensing Bureau. They sign the certificate. But then when you present it, you sign it again using some sort of wallet technology. Now, all of that, again, might sound theoretical, but we've been using this technology for 10 or 15 years in um, chip cards, and we've been using it for the last three years in mobile phone wallets. So under the covers, when you, um, you know, when you've got click to pay in your, in your iPhone, and I'm going to talk about iPhone because, you know, that's just me, but it's exactly the same for Google. Um, if you click to pay in a mobile phone app, it, it reaches inside the secure element of your phone. It pulls out some data relating to your Visa or MasterCard or Amex card that has been loaded with your consent and with the consent of the bank. I verified one a card this morning. There you go. Mm. Now, when you click to present or click to pay, um, your phone is doing some magic cryptography under the covers. It's also digitally signing on behalf of yourself and sending it off to the merchant. So the merchant gets a cryptographic parcel of information, data and metadata, and the merchant goes, okay, look, I've got the credit card number. I've got it from Steve Wilson. I've also actually got it from Steve Wilson's iPhone. They can actually tell what iPhone I'm using. Now, that's goodness because they know that the phone's been unlocked by the person who owns the phone, which is... But, but th this, this is all great and good for us, but... One of the things we have to do is trust the people to whom we give that data, don't we? Oh, yeah. So, you know, first thing is give them as little as possible. <laughs> um, disclosure minimization is like a really important rule. Um, I don't want to tell the liquor store anything more than, um, well, ideally my credit card number, my delivery address, and the fact that I'm over 18. 
So um, they don't even know need to know your year of birth or anything. They just need to know, yes, this person's allowed to buy booze in Australia. Yeah. So yeah. we we this is one of the things, you know, I'm always um I always feel really uncomfortable when I go to an RSL club. I don't go very mm. often. I usually go, it's usually there's some kind of meeting there and I have to hand over my driver's license and they scan it and oh. I just hate that. Yeah, I, I was there last week. We had something local in the golf club and um, I was that guy in the queue that held things up while I said, you're not scanning my driver's license because on the front of your license is the license card number. Yeah. Um, so I... Um, I, I said I'd rather type in all of the information that you really need, and I did that. Um, that's so important. I mean, that what, what sort of database is, is being run at a golf club? I mean, how <laughs> hackable is that? It's terrible. Is, if, if the government is going to regulate anything, they should regulate this kind of stuff. Yeah. They should re re regulate data minimization where they just need to know that I don't live within five miles, five kilometers, and I am over 18. They're the only two facts they need to know about me. Yeah, exactly. So it goes back to your thing of context and relevance. Yeah. And in New South Wales, we're getting really close. You know, the digital driver's license is le leading to uh, a digital identity. I wish they wouldn't call it that because it's actually it's actually a lot less than identity. Um, when this thing's up and running, it's been piloted and it's working fairly well, but it's really a collection of factoids. And um, I think we've got to stop calling that identity. It, you know, the fact that I'm over 18 and live 10 k's away, that's not my identity. It's just a really important attribute. <clears throat> and I can prove it using the New South Wales technology. Um, but pe people are going to call it an identity because... <laughs> yeah. Well, the trouble is that there's two different sorts of identity. You know, there's my identity is Steve Wilson biological, you know, entity, and I feel that strongly, and it's analog, and it's it's biological, and it's social, and it's me, and it's you know everybody else can bugger off, and my identity is sovereign. But that's not what we're dealing with online. Online, we're dealing with a whole lot of little factoids that are relevant in different contexts, and it's so different from identity that. You know, I've been in identity for nearly 30 years, and it's the slowest corner of IT by miles. Um, we have been having the same arguments about digital identity for 15 years. And it's slow because we make it too complicated, and it's slow because we call it identity. I mean, I'm just going to be quite blunt about that. It's not what, identity. What should we call it? We should call it attributes or facts and figures or, or credentials. Um that's great. You know, if 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 I'm an accountant and I know and I need to sign off an audit report, or I tell you what, if I'm a homeowner and a and somebody comes to the door to fix my pipes and they're a plumber, I don't want to know anything about that person other than the fact that they're a licensed plumber. And but, that they have no complaints against them. Yeah, okay, that's good too. That's good. Um now you've got to stitch all that stuff together accurately so that you index the data properly. So you know that it applies to the right person. But, you know, if a plumber came to your door and you said, show me your identity, they'd probably be insulted because they just want to show you that they're a plumber. Um, so when you say, what do we call it? I, I just think it's incredibly lazy that we keep calling this constellation of facts and figures identity because it's just, it's so not identity. <laughs> I, I just remember back when we were talking about web 2.0 which was the stupid and wrong name for that and we got stuck with it and then there was web 3.0 which was allegedly crypto and digital currencies and stuff which was also a wrong and stupid name so there are so many wrong and stupid names out there <laughs> yep and um and we don't seem to have the sort of temerity to to fix that you know what's in a name a lot especially when you're playing with identity and it, it crosses between lay people and, and deeply technical people and it, it crosses over between professions and citizens and government regulators. I think it's really important that we call the spade a spade. And we know there's too much identity information out there. Look at the Optus breach. It is ridiculous that I am vulnerable because some facts and figures of mine have fallen into the dark web. It is ridiculous that people can just play my numbers behind my back and and assume my identity it's ridiculous so um there's so much identity sloshing around out there why don't we just 
try to minimize identity. And the first <laughs> the first step is to call call it is call, call it what it is. And it's 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 data. It's facts and figures. So so like some of those recent data breaches. I can't remember which one now. One of them was. <laughs> did you just? I know what minutes. you did there. <laughs> but but one of them was they were using production data in a test environment and hadn't secured their test environment adequately. Mm. And I just my blood runs cold when I think of how many organisations that would fit, because you know a lot of the times they don't pl- apply all the same controls to non-production environments. So. You know, if I was a bad person, I'd be out there poking around at people's test environments. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I started a lot of my career before identity in the medical devices, and there was a horror story of a, a medical. We they're, they're called pacemaker programmers. They're special purpose modified PCs, modified laptops that doctors use to um, interrogate upload data from a pacemaker and reprogram its parameters. And a really famous pacemaker hacker <clears throat> got out on eBay, found one of these things for a thousand bucks, bought it, um, overrode the normal login, just got into DOS and found that on the hard drive was the complete test environment mm. and a whole lot of dev code and the passwords for the dev environment that <laughs> had been copied onto the hard drive of this medical device. Unbelievable. Yeah, and and I I think that there is genuinely so much bad pra- bad practice on a customary level out there in IT land where developers have done stuff like that without thinking about it because there was not any perceived risk. Yeah. But now now that now that you don't have to rob banks, you used to have to rob banks to make money, and now you can sit at home in your pajamas in your mother's basement. And just get online and do the equivalent of rob- robbing banks. So there's a real incentive for people to work out where weak spots are like that. So a lot of, a lot of our practices in IT are really, really bad and need need a severe uplift. Yeah, yeah. We need to take a, a hard look at ourselves, don't we, Kate? Hmm. The thing about sitting in your basement doing identity theft, um, it, it reminds me of another point about the quality of data. Um, all of that stolen data gets replayed in know your customer processes. So to open a new online bank account, <clears throat> all I need to know is somebody's birth certificate and passport and driver's license. Um, now, nobody does that online. and Nobody does it face-to-face anymore. As far as I know, criminals don't go down to um, the back blocks and buy fake passports for 100 bucks and fake driver's licenses for 50 bucks and then rock up to the local suburban bank branch and open a bank account. I don't think anybody does that anymore. Um, Instead, you can buy the same data online for about a tenth of the price is the going rate. Now, what's interesting to me is that the KYC process is still the same. Like the bank still just wants to know four or five facts about you in an algorithm that then says it's probably Steve Wilson. And it's, you know, it's good enough. Um, so the, the problem with so-called identity theft is that it's actually data theft. Mm. Um, people don't steal Steve Wilson's identity. They just steal enough facts and figures about me that they can pretend to be me online. And this is all about data. So when the government responds, I mean, that, I, I, I'm so divided in my opinion about this. I, I love that our government is responding <clears throat> with real you know, muscles against the Optus breach and doing something about it. But it disturbs me that they seem to be moving towards the national ID as a response to this, because we don't need any new ID. What we need to do is to make our existing identity facts and figures better so that they can't be replayed. So I like to say that we don't have any identity problem in the wake of the Optus breach. We've got a data problem. And I wish that we were really sort of focused about that, because if we could solve the provenance of data for identification purposes, then, oh, my God, you could solve the provenance of data in in the AI world that we're all worried about. Or, you know, we're worried about who's training the data, where's the data coming from. We're worried about algorithmic transparency. So when a credit rating is made or an insurance rating is made and it's not in my favour, I'd like to know what the algorithm is. Well, we could know that. We We could stamp 
all of these analytics processes with the algorithm and we could stamp it with the provenance of the data. So there's this pattern in my mind that all of these problems boil down to data and metadata. We, we, we live on data, we, we need to have better data quality and we could actually measure data quality and we could, we could imprint the data quality like a hallmark on every piece of data that matters um, in a fairly straightforward way. You know, as, as they say, we have the technology. Just to pick up on something that, that you just mentioned, you know, you know, when traditionally when we recommend people start to use multi-factor authentication, we do it because um, there's another factor that is not inherent in the thing itself. So, you know, it's typically something you know, something you have and something you are. So yep. the, something, something you are is your identity, the, you know, and so... So one of the things we probably need is something that I have that I can say, this is really me, it's not some stranger. And and increase what we're probably going to have to be able to do is take that kind of a multi-factor authentication approach into mm. the identity world so that we can avoid this problem of someone pretending to be you or me yeah. online opening up a new bank account with the stuff they got off the dark web yeah um and it's that additional the additional factors of of yes some facts about yourself but some other thing that only i know so are you going towards the proof of humanness kind of issue and the you know the world coin project and they're trying no to no no i don't want to the... go i don't want to go that way because <laughs> i just think i think that's that's just creating a, a very large honeypot for someone to steal. But but um, increasingly we're going to have to solve this. And I think that that yeah. a lot of the approaches don't allow for anything outside of facts, these things that you're referring to as facts. So, And facts are very easy to get hold of in our world because they're data and people steal data. Oh, and, and this is exactly my, my mission, though, Kate, or my, my passion, um, because data can be stolen, you need that extra layer of metadata that says, well, look, it's not just a fact, you know, my driver's license is one, two, three, four, X, Y, Z. Um, but when that string comes across the internet and hits a website, it can also be signed by me so that the web, the web server knows that it's come from a person in control of a private key that's certified and bound which to is, Which is the other factor that I'm talking about. Do you want to right. unpack yeah. that for folks? Because I'm not sure everyone will understand what we're talking about. Well, it's back to this digital signature thing. That A digital signature is an extra code. Um, I actually call it metadata. Um, it, it, in itself, it, it's meaningless. It's just literally like 256 ones and zeros. But it's a code that's generated um, from a cryptographic key in a secure element, which is, you know, your, your phone hardware or a, or a chip card, the, the signature um, is processed on the core data. So if I want to prove my credit card number, I sign that in my in my iPhone, the credit card number and the, that signature code goes across the network and it hits the server, the, the merchant server. The merchant server uses a public key. It's like a master key to undo the signature and it sees that it matches two things. The, the signature matches the hardware that it came from and the signature matches that credit card number. So you get some programmatic logic. You get a, a rule that, that can be in the software at the merchant that says, if that signature code checks out, then I know that this credit card number has been presented by the guy that controls the credit card. And um, that pattern has been with us for a very long time in payments. And like I say, it's been very popular in Apple Pay and Google Pay now for about three or four years in wallets. It's exactly the same pattern that we need to present any important data. And if you so, had that, then so nobody you, would be vulnerable after the Opus breach. Have, you, have would, you considered would, how you might um, mesh um, something like homomorphic encryption into that world? Um, sure. It's an, extra, it's an extra layer. So the, I think the important layer is the bottom layer that says, this is the provenance of the data. We know where it's come from. Yeah. So you build but, up on top of that and say, well, let, let's make the data even more secure, like defense in depth. Um, homomorphic encryption is a clever way of um, scrambling the data so that 
it, no one's it. So on I screen. might just exp I might just explain that for people because not everybody knows probably knows what homomorphic encryption is. It's something that Ian Opperman and I are really obsessed with at the moment. So homomorphic encryption is a form of encryption that allows people to do computations on encrypted underlying data without the need to decrypt it. So that's what it is. And I was just thinking that if you took what Steve said and and put that in together, it would be a really nice package yeah. because, um, you know, we're, we're putting a lot of trust in our phones to do this for us. Yep. Yeah, we sure are. Um, you know, we, we put our lives into our phones now. It's, it's the sort of fulcrum for everything that we do. Yeah, my, I, I grab my phone rather than my wallet now because everything's on my phone. I love that you're doing homomorphic encryption with Ian because it, it is that extra layer of it, it's the absolute way of minimizing disclosure because with, with homomorphic encryption works and you don't ever need to unscramble the data. Yeah, that's why I love it. I'm, I'm fascinated by it and I think it's it's one yeah. of the really big future things. Um, so one, of the, one other question, because I need to let you go, um, is how how do you see this sort of playing out in the real world is is this likely to be something like people are present, pursuing the national identity the state identity and all of that stuff do you see the the stuff that you're talking about becoming uh how will it play into that space do you think well we've got these patterns that people are used to now like click to click to pay and um and tap to pay <clears throat> The very same technology could present any facts and figures using the same cryptographic wrapping and and signatures so that when you present some code online to a to the other side of the world, the server knows that it's come from Steve Wilson with my consent. And um it it's it's different data for different contexts. So if I need to prove my age, then the relying party, the rule is I'll trust in the age if it comes from a, a license authority. Um, or if I'm trying to claim that <clears throat> I um, have a particular health condition and I want to quote my health identifier, then that is a totally different fact and it needs to come from a totally different context. But we've sorted this out for payments. You know, a merchant anywhere in the world can accept my credit card without knowing me or, or even my bank because of this layer of layers and layers of, of provenance. So I think it's going to play out in a, in a really mundane way. I can see my my smartphone wallet having verifiable credentials for maybe 20 or 25 facts and figures that matter every month. And those facts and figures are issued from respective um, issuers. They're not issued by Apple. They're not issued by um, the bank. Um, they're issued by different communities of interest. Now, you, what you need to do is to distribute the metadata that allows all of this to be unpacked and digested. Now, the payment system distributes metadata through merchant banks, acquiring banks, set merchants up to accept Amex or Diners or Visa or Amex. I know it all too well. Right. Well, what that involves is the merchant has privileges into the network through their own bank, um, the so-called merchant bank, and the merchant bank signs them up to a set of terms and conditions and a standard contract. And the merchant bank also provides a gateway. And in that gateway is the metadata that allows a merchant to know the difference between a MasterCard and a Visa card and an Amex card. It's a really elegant technical model for distributing the metadata so that credit cards make sense. Who would have thought credit cards will save us in the future? Well, I mean, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> they are, uh, this is going to sound really sort of pathological they are my inspiration <laughs> um, I, I don't want visa and mastercard to run this network i think it's got to be a new a new network but we do look at what they what they have done is that they've made these very important facts and figures absolutely digestible anywhere in the world it's a it's a tech it's a technological marvel that i can go to um mongolia and and buy a souvenir with an australian bank issued mastercard yeah. Think about that. How the hell does the does It the would be really good if if our identity was as easy to use as that. So that it is could, a really great note be. to end on. It could Thank be just so much, as easy Steve. as that. Really appreciate your time this evening. Great pleasure, Kate.
thanks for um thanks for digging in and that is it for another episode of the data revolution podcast i'm kate crothers thank you so much for listening please don't forget to give the show a nice review and a like on your podcast app of choice see you next time